Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me is my now home-owning sidekick, <laughs> Jonathan Carey. Hello. Good morning. How, good morning. <laughs> do, do you feel broke? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Bank account has whittled down. <laughs> but you're a homeowner. Yeah, so finally, finally made the step. So. Oh, hooray. Well, I've already um, sent a letter to all your neighbors letting them know there's going to be a, um, a whole bunch of pizza delivery um, drivers <laughs> in the area and that it's due to their new neighbor. So I've let mm. them know it's okay. Okay. The, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm one of those people that gets carry out. So, you know, so it shouldn't be too bad. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I wasted all that time on that letter for nothing? <laughs> I'm sure they appreciated it. <laughs> yes. Well, um, welcome to you have your little slice of 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 land and a, yeah. a, a building on it. So it's apparently it's the the American dream. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I do have a white picket fence, so you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now I just need the two point one kids and a dog, and then oh set, gosh. So. <laughs> I mean, where can we find that? I can give you. I can get, I'll lend you the kids, the dog. I don't know. I, I'm a little bit more. <laughs> I think I might want uh, the dog. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think we'll be fighting over the dog because uh, she's, yeah, you know how, you yeah, know how I feel about her. Jonathan. You're quick to offer up your kids. So. <laughs> I know. I, I, I'm always quick to offer. very good. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I have one that um, is now becoming, has now more useful. He got his driver's permit. Oh, look out. Well, he's not oh useful yet, but he's on his way to usefulness. Well, um, okay. So we, after we got it, I took him out and, uh, <laughs> the feedback I got was <laughs> my daughter said, you need to find some coping strategies on those drives. <laughs> I was like, okay. And she's like, bring a stress ball, be quiet, whatever you need to do. I was like, that is good feedback, but it's, it's hard. You feel very vulnerable. It's yeah, a, that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> yes, it's but I mean we all learned, right? Everybody who's you see on the road, we all had to go through well, that. Some people I don't think really ever learned. No, <laughs> they I agree. somehow drive. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but I realized too that so I have you know now they make these magnets that say you know student driver, so people don't get oh, okay. as frustrated. And I realized that I have been driving around with them, and yesterday. <laughs> I um, made a huge mistake at a construction zone and like, I was like, oh gosh, you know, and then I had to quickly get back in the lane and I was thinking <laughs> uh, the person behind me was going to be so irritated. And then I realized <laughs> I had all those stickers on the car. So I was like, I'm, I'm never taking them off. That's so funny. Yeah. I should just get that and put it on my car, but then be the person just like weaving in and out. Yes. <laughs> it was like, you get a free pass. So yeah. yeah. Until it's they like see cop you. Cop pulls you over. It's like, I'm a student driver. Don't worry about it. Didn't you see my, did you not see the magnet sorry officer did you you must have not seen the magnet so well um okay i want we want to get into this episode it oh i could have just I, as i said i'm like i don't want you to go he was so wonderful and i think it's i think our listeners are going to just learn so much from him he's just not only just really experienced but also just a really good human and a, and a great um slp so Today, our guest is Maurice Goodwin, and let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a licensed and practicing speech language pathologist, voice teacher, and active performer now living in Houston, Texas. Professionally, he specializes in the evaluation and the treatment of the singing voice and voice disorders at the Texas Voice Center and as adjunct faculty at Lamar University. Following his undergraduate studies in music performance at Shenandoah, Shenandoah University, he completed his graduate work in speech language pathology at the University of Pittsburgh. He is a regular lecturer and presenter at conferences focused on the health and education of professional voice users. He is passionate about vocal health education and the intersections of identity and voice. And I think you will um, hear his passion just through what he shares with us. So excited to have Maurice. So welcome Maurice Goodwin to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you today. Thank you for having me. Yes. No, I just, um, I can't wait to 
dive in. Um, you are definitely a subject matter expert, and I'm really excited to learn because you have a lot of information that I feel like a lot of us do not get in school. So before, though, we, we start with that, I always just love to know what Tell us a little bit about your professional journey, how you ended up where you are. And I know, you know, yours maybe took some twists and turns. So I just want to hear, hear your story. Certainly. Yeah. My, my story probably starts all the way back to when I was a kid, I grew up in a pretty musical family and started training as a musician pretty young. And so then I was working professionally as a singer kind of since my late teen years. Uh, and I, my coffee mug. I'm representing my undergrad Shenandoah University. I got a degree in music performance, but pretty, pretty close towards the end of that program. I knew I did not want to be like a professional singer. uh, And I was studying classical music and I knew that probably wasn't the area that I wanted to go into. And so I was looking for other things and I really enjoyed like our anatomy and physiology of the voice classes that took me into speech pathology. Um, I had the the privilege of being trained at the University of Pittsburgh, which with some pretty wonderful humans. And they kind of really led me to where I am today. Um, And so I worked in a lab at the voice center there and I got to complete my graduate studies there. uh, And then did my fellowship at the University of Wisconsin where I also got to kind of focus just in adult voice disorders, which was like another kind of gift to the work that I do now. Uh, and here I am, kind of all these years later. It's been eight years since I started this journey. Eight years, nine years ago. Um, yeah, I'd seen like a memory on Facebook come up of of me at my first conference with other speech pathologists when I was still an undergrad. Um, so it was a nice little trip down memory lane. Yes, I, I love those reminders because it's almost like, Oh, good. Yes, I had completely forgotten about that. And so it is like, yeah. what did people do before that? I guess they just forgot. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I love your story because it, I, I, we, and I think I hear this often from people that go into speech pathology that it's like wasn't necessarily where they were going to go first, but hmm. they started with something that really led them down that road. And I mean, you're exactly right. What, what better combination from you know, singing and the voice yeah. to speech pathology? Yeah. And, and I had never heard of a speech pathologist before I was maybe 23, 24. Um, I had gone to undergrad a little bit later. So it wasn't a field that I had just ignored or thought it wasn't for me. I didn't even know it was there. And if I did, I probably would have started a little sooner than senior year in terms of studying and trying to get the right courses. Um, that's something that ASHA uh, is even trying to think about, right? Um, when we talk about diversifying the field or making a field look different? How do we even let people know that it is a field? <laughs> I think my closest to like non-physician idea of getting into medicine was like nursing, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't think speech pathology in terms of jobs in the hospital, which is the setting that I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, ex- I think, and you're exactly right that I, cause I also didn't really know until my a teacher said, this is what I think you should do. And I said, Huh? Oh, okay, great. I'll, I'll do that. But <laughs> yeah. I, but you're right. I mean, we definitely are, you know, play such a critical role that it would be great to where you just know this is a potential option. Yeah. Um, but so now do you still, I, I can tell just from the way you talk that you probably are a beautiful singer. Do you still do anything in that arena? Yeah. So one of the things that I really wanted to do as, as I started working as a speech pathologist was to stay disciplined in terms of voice training. So I actually still take voice lessons (laughs) on a regular basis. I'm not performing anymore, um, but it's more a personal enjoyment um, and something that I can challenge myself with. It's also good for me to be a student and to kind of be walking through the same process that I'm asking my patients or my students to. Um, And so I'm asking them to make change and them to be more aware. And that's also a really helpful thing for me to do for myself. I can kind of relate better uh, in those instances. So it's a good discipline for me. I I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great reminder. I think regardless of what our area of specialty is, is we need to remember what are we asking of our patients Mm, or mm, clients mm. or students. And so you're exactly, I love that you keep yourself, you know, you have that perspective where you actually know um, and 
Okay, I do. I, I bet you are fun at karaoke, though. I just, I have to say, I, bet you. <laughs> <laughs> I get so nervous with karaoke. I no. enjoy watching it, but I don't enjoy singing it. What's wild is I, um, like most recently, sang with Houston Grand Opera here in town. I'll sing oh, with wow. their chorus or other things. I don't mind that environment. It's like the mm -hmm. karaoke thing where everyone's watching <laughs> you and you have a mic. I tend to shy away from that. So you don't have a go-to song. Mm, okay. So my two songs. Okay. There are two. I, I'm okay. saying I don't do it, but I'll give you two. Superstition, okay. Stevie Wonder. Oh, that's like a go-to. Yeah. Um, it's a good one. And there's another, um, you know, you could do like a, a solid Backstreet Boys, quit playing games with my oh, heart, you know? You, you can't go wrong. You just, you can't. That, that, you can't. That's always going to be a crowd pleaser. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'll, we'll we'll have to uh, catch up some time with karaoke that'll, because that'll yeah. be the um, the tag at the end of the episode. This is us karaokeing to uh, oh, Backstreet Boys. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be your backup <laughs> singer. You you're going to take the lead. You're going to take the lead. So, <laughs> well, and I want to know too because I know you said that you know the anatomy and that you know of the voice is what really drew you, and then it into that wanting to specialize more in that. And then you had some great, sounds like professors and mentors at your university program. But what was it that really made hmm. you decide, oh, voice therapy, this is what I want to do? Yeah. What was interesting was I felt like my interest was very singular heading into grad school. Um, but you know how they make you do all of these different settings. And mm -hmm. I went to the University of Pittsburgh where we had six different settings during graduate school because we don't have an on-campus clinic. Um, and so I actually started my first um, externship, I guess, uh, before I began classes, uh, just with how the calendar worked out. And so, I mean, you're like overexposed to all of these different things. And so, I mean, I had loved early intervention. I loved inpatient. Um, I really enjoyed like the balance of inpatient and outpatient. And so doing voice by the end became something that I had put a lot of my training and effort towards. However, there were so many more interests that I had in our field. And I actually think that's true for most clinicians. Um, and honestly, probably why our field still looks the way it does, where it's so flexible that you can do many things. Um, yeah, so what what made me realize that voice was the thing? I think it was like getting into my fellowship and and really starting to work with the patient population and gaining more independence. I realized that it helped express like the best of my personality and what I could bring to the table. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. Do I think like, you know, we, I hear sometimes people talk about the work that they do. Do I think I was like born to be a voice therapist? Certainly not. Um, but I, I really enjoy it, right? Like if we have to work, I would rather be doing this than probably anything else. Well, and, and you're, you're so right. I think something you said is something I try to say to new grads all the time is that it's almost a blessing and a curse that are, this field is so diverse because mm. it's like, oh, wow, I can do all these things. It's like, oh, wow, I can do all these things. Like, what am I going to do? Cause I, <laughs> so, but I really like that you said that you had tried all these other things and yeah. really liked them as well. But this was just kind of the one that, that stuck with you and it yeah. seemed like, um, but not because you went into it saying, this is what I want to do from the beginning. I'm not going right. to even try anything else, but having that open mind, because you just, you never know if, if one of those settings would have been preferred to voice, but it yeah. just sounds like that was the path you needed to take. I also felt, especially working in early intervention, I was doing a lot of um, working with like children um, with different like early development diagnoses with OT and PT and things, mm -hmm. it taught me how to be a therapist. Like I had, mm -hmm. voice therapy can be mm, different from other types of speech therapy in terms of categories. So I never really knew how to set things up. And there's something about like the structure and the discipline of like a speech disorder that really helps you learn how to do therapy. I felt like I learned how to do therapy by working with kids. And then you just yes. take those same skills and use them on adults because adults are just like large children. Yes. I always say if you can, if you can get a get, work with a kid, you could, it's truly you could, you most likely work with an adult. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> most of the time we know yeah. there's sometimes where, so you, you've 
go to your, you know, down this path for you realize the voice is what you want to do and do your clinical fellowship. And did you do your clinical fellowship in the same facility that you work currently or different? Different. Yeah. I, I did my fellowship in Wisconsin. So I spent ah. a year of cold, cold, cold. Uh, and after that, after, well, after a few months, I knew that was not going to be my forever plan. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, well, kind of an interesting bump in the journey. I finished my fellowship and could not find a job. Um, and so I went without a job for almost five months after my fellowship. And, you know, I had graduated oh. from what I thought was a great university and did a great fellowship. Um, and it's no fault to them and probably no fault to me. It's just like how things worked out. It was the market like at the time and having such specific training meant that I could not do a lot of things if I wanted to. Um, you know, so I was mm -hmm. a grad that had never really seen a pediatric client alone. I had never seen a cog cognition client ever up to that point. Mm -hmm. So that excludes you from a lot of work too. Um, yeah, so I went for five months without a job and I bartended uh, and I got connected uh, to the job that I have now. I had actually applied, got rejected. <laughs> and then somebody was like, I think you'd be perfect for this job. And I was like, you know, I think so too. And they knew some people <laughs> that worked at the facility. And so they connected us. Um, and I moved down to Houston, Texas to work at Houston Methodist Hospital at the Texas Voice Center. Uh, and I've been there ever since. It's been what a cool four and a half years now. Yeah. Wow. I love that story. That is, it's like, it, it's, it is just like one of those where everything worked out the way that it needed to. And had you yeah. gotten a job sooner somewhere, you wouldn't have had this one. And this one seems like it's such a great fit for you. So it's perfect. I'm, I'm glad that that worked out. Um, so am I. And so... I, I got to bartend <laughs> in the meantime. So that was, that was fun. You know, I was just saying to somebody and I waited tables, but I was like, I really think that would have been so fun. It was cool. Maybe, I mean, it's not, it's not a, I can still do it. I can go back and bartend. I know, <laughs> I just... know. I always think if I ever like really didn't want to be a speech pathologist, but I wanted to stay here, what would I do? And I was like, oh, I'd bartend. Like, yeah, well, no brainer. There you go. Yeah, yeah. it always seems, it always seems fun, but I'm sure there's also down uh, cons to it as well. But <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> that's another podcast we'll talk about. <laughs> yeah. That's the after show. Yes, the, the show after, after show, the show, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so tell us about what's a day in the life, I think, of just, you know, what you're doing at the hospital. And yeah. you also have a, a private practice as well. So what would a day in the life in, your, in, in the hospital look like for you? Yeah, so... The hospital, I work kind of in a large outpatient ENT clinic. Um, so all of my direct colleagues are physicians. And then there are two speech pathologists, three audiologists, and a PA that work in the practice. And um, what's really nice about the practice setup is that we're all technically independent providers. So my schedule is my schedule. Um, I'm not part of a rehab department, which is really unique in terms of contracting and pay um, that I think we could probably end up talking about more in our field, um, just how the contracts work and what that looks like. Um, so I have a lot of autonomy in the position that I have, which is really nice. Um, and it allows me to kind of tailor the work that I do even on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so any day can be anything, as in there are some days where I have 10 new patients in a row. There are some days where I have seven therapy patients in a row. There are some days where I have six teletherapy patients and then two new patients in person. And so it tends to be really flexible just based on what the practice needs. In our practice, all the new patients see a speech pathologist and a physician at the same time. So we have kind of a collaborative approach in terms of clinic, which is pretty standard for voice centers around the country, but not necessarily standard for how all speech pathologists work. Um, and so that's a that's a kind of a unique thing. Um, grateful, I don't just like how our job works. I don't have um, productivity standards at all, which allow me to focus on other things that help build the practice. So I present a lot at conferences and we work a lot on research. And so as long as we're kind of contributing, uh, it counts. And so I feel like I'm in, a, I'm in the sweet spot in terms of academic medicine and also kind of being a little more independent. It's really cool. 
I mean, this is sounds like a dream job. I mean, you're saying it thinking, what? You have yeah. no productivity standards. You have this yeah. autonomy. It's yeah. this collaborative approach. Yeah. I mean, you could kind of hit the jackpot with this one. This is, it, sounds like a great. Remember, I said I thought it was a great job fit for this job, too. Yeah. <laughs> So they hit the jackpot with you and you, it's yes. like, you know, mutual, but yeah, wow, that's a, uh, yeah. And I, I think you, you're exactly right for a, maybe that's what when you're going to come back to another podcast and we're going to do karaoke and talk about contracts I love hey, it. because you're right. That it. is another whole arena that I think, well, I don't think I know that a lot of us really don't have that knowledge about It's not yeah. something we're taught or part of our schooling. So, yeah. um, so I like that you bring that up. Um, and so with, so every single patient that you're working with is somebody who's already been identified or is suspected of having s some sort of voice disorder. Or problem. Correct. Correct. Um, and what's interesting, you know, we think about speech pathology as a lot of therapy and my job is a lot of therapy. I'd say maybe 50% of my time is spent in one-on-one -on -one, like behavioral voice therapy, but I'd say 50% is spent in diagnostics. So we do a lot of new patient evals where we're just trying to figure out what's going on. And then being in the city of Houston, I mean, it's a city of millions of people and there are only two speech pathologists in our practice. So we do a lot of referring out to other therapists. So I evaluate more patients than I see. We, we try and keep in-house the things that are a bit more challenging or the things we're like that I care about. So I keep a lot of the singers that I evaluate just because it's easier for me to work with them than maybe a speech pathologist who's never had music training. Um, so it kind of comes down to like what's most practical. Um, and then even within that 50% of doing therapy, a lot of it is education. We do a lot of pre and post surgical education. You know, you think about the head and neck cancer population, they're doing a lot of education and a lot of testing before and after. It'd be similar in terms of what we do in our practice. I work with two surgeons so a lot of the work that we do is pre and post surgery or some sort of procedure on the vocal folds. We'll be right back to our interview. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible, Med Travelers. If you are a therapist interested in traveling, visit medtravelers.com to explore the amazing benefits that Med Travelers has to offer. Featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. Visit medtravelers.com to begin your travel adventure today. And now back to the show. So that um, leads me to my next question is just what are, what is is there a percentage of uh, like this many of uh, have the, of the patients have this diagnosis yeah. this many so what is what is the <clears throat> typical diagnoses that you work with and or or not typical i would say probably the most typical that we see are some form of vocal fold paralysis or paresis like a vocal cord weakness i think it's largely due to the fact that houston has the largest medical center in the world just like beds in the same area and there is a lot of surgery happening. There's a lot of trauma happening. Uh, there's a lot of intubation injuries. There are a lot of things happening. On top of just like the normal occurrence of voice disorders, we see a lot of vocal fold paralysis. Um, and then we see a lot of singers and people who are professional voice users who would have what we would call like phonotraumatic vocal fold lesions. So polyps, cysts, vocal fold nodules, things like that. And they kind of break down then into surgical and non-surgical behavioral stuff. Um, so those would be probably the two most common. Things that are more rare um, from my practice, I do not see a lot of upper airway, which tends to kind of pair with voice. My colleague, Teresa Proctor, does. She really cares about that and has an interest in that, and I do not. So <laughs> I like end up so that works out well. a lot of things to her. <laughs> <laughs> That works out very, very well, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> and I, and it's interesting. So, um, cause I, you know, worked with NICU babies as uh -huh. most of my SLP career. And so that's, I, it's, I was just having a, a flashback that any of the babies that I work with that were in the NICU for a long time intubated, they mm -hmm. often did have trouble and have the paresis or mm -hmm. paralysis. So 
Is that the most common? Is the intubation is the most common reason hmm. that that would happen? Um, we see a number of things. We see a lot of like post ACDF anterior anterior cervical disc fusion surgeries. Um, mm. That's a very very common, very common thyroid procedures, um, either thyroidectomies, partial or complete. Uh, and just due to the nature of the procedure, patients will end up having some sort of focal cord abnormality after, whether it's due to intubation or the procedure itself. One of the hard things about doing that is, you know, as a speech pathologist, we see a lot of it sometimes from the same hospital systems or, you know, it's spread equally among physicians, but it takes so long for patients to get help or to find help. And so what's frustrating is that sometimes we'll see someone who's been aphonic or without a voice for six months because they didn't know that there was a thing like a voice center. They didn't know there were speech pathologists and doctors that specialized in voice. And um, so we do a lot of like education to other physicians and surgeons in the area too. Like, hi, we're here. You know, your patient waking up from surgery without a voice, while it may be common, is not necessarily normal or should be considered typical. Um, and certainly if they have, you know, like we say, if they have any hoarseness or dysphonia lasting longer than two to three weeks, then care should be sought out if possible. Yeah. And I hadn't put all that together, but you're right. I mean, with, you know, MD Anderson and all those, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's a tier Memorial there's probably... Herman, there's <sighs> children's hospital here. There's, yes. there's a lot of big systems, St. Luke's. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, the amount of surgeries and intubation that's happening every day and you're right that I, and that, that education is key because yeah. I say, we don't know what we don't know. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, you are, you all in, in educating are actually helping people get what they need sooner. And that's, yeah. that's pretty powerful to, yeah. to have that influence over, some, you know, that's how change happens. So that's great. Yeah. I would say like probably a majority of also probably a majority of our patient population has already seen another ENT prior to coming to us. Mm. So they either come in with a diagnosis or come in with something's not normal and we're kind of the second stop which makes our work really fun. We get to be like really specialized. We do a lot of education. I really enjoy that part. Yeah, no, that is fun. Cause that's again, that you're giving that person the knowledge and that they can run with it and make those changes as well. So, mm -hmm. and, and when you say the lesions, I'm thinking of like, you know, when Adele or some of the singers, like their can't, their concerts being, you know, on hold because of, is that the polyps Correct. and lesions with that just from that vocal abuse is what I guess is that still the term or is it yeah not I think anymore? just like voice w one interesting thing that we're kind of learning is that like everyone gets them right you can be the best singer in the world you can be the, the technically most correct um, but if your vocal folds are slamming together um, you're at risk of a vocal fold lesion you know we have I think of a story of us of an artist a Broadway artist who uh, imitated an animal at the zoo and ended up with a vocal fold polyp. And so she wasn't abusing her voice. She was just using it like any of us would. And it just so happened to, to result in a polyp. You think about singers and artists that are extremely careful, but sometimes touring in life means too much, too fast, too soon, right? It's so much going on that it just results in the body not being able to necessarily keep up. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we do a lot of that pre and post big events, tours, concerts, recordings, um, which is a whole nother kind of beast in terms of managing care. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. It'd be like, if you were a, a runner, you know, yeah. you, if you don't strengthen the muscles around your joints, you're going to have more knee injuries. I mean, it would, oh, totally. yeah, why would that be any different? But I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it that way before. Yeah. So like, when I mean, we think about it, like, your vocal folds are vibrating more than someone who does not do this. You're just like at an increased risk. And there are certain factors. Teachers, unfortunately, are probably the, the number one profession that we see. Um, but teachers are also doing 900 things at once, right? And, and often teachers are putting their own physical, <laughs> probably and mental and emotional well-being last for the sake of all of their students, right? And that often means that their voice ends up taking a pretty big hit. Um, so that's that's a profession that we unfortunately see 
all of the time. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because a friend of mine, she is a teacher and she had a horrible, this whole last year was, yeah. and had to have this special device to project yeah. her voice yeah. and was like, you're not allowed to speak for this long. She's mm -hmm. like, I have, I have elementary students. How am I supposed to not speak? So yeah, yeah, I, I that makes perfect sense. I always um, tell my teachers too, um, I can tell you're a good teacher, right? When you're here <laughs> because you care so much about the information and communicating with your students that you're like forgetting about yourself. Yeah. Aww, and so it takes like a, it. it's a rebalancing uh, yeah. in the classroom. How do we bring some of that energy back to you? I can tell you're a giving person or you probably wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great way to, to, to think about it. And that's probably means a lot for them to hear it. Yeah. Maybe that's, um, you know, teacher of the year award should be given <laughs> on who has the most polyps. If you have a, <laughs> <laughs> There maybe I mean, should be a, a study thought. done on that exact <laughs> I thing. Yeah. I know. It's like, okay, <laughs> got to give this one the award. This yeah. one's got it. Uh, um, and, uh, and again, I, I, could, I also could go back to the the woman imitating the, the zoo animal and how she yeah. hurt, but I, that's another, we'll use that for another po podcast too, but I'm just like, what? <laughs> I, have, I have questions about that, but, but, um, but yeah, so it just goes to show that it doesn't, it really is, like you said, it could be like long-term, it could be you know, something that happens acutely. It's, it's, it sounds like it's, you know, together, they're, they're fragile. They're, they're, there's not much, there's not much substance to the vocal folds. Yeah. yeah. Fragile. So with, Yes, very <laughs> a delicate. Maybe that's yes, a better word. Yes, delicate. delicate. Yes. <laughs> so, how when you're assessing when somebody comes in, what are your preferred methods to assess them? Do you have specific equipment? Is it yeah? You know, what it walk us through kind of what what that looks like? Yeah. Um, what's really interesting uh, in voice is that uh, some of our diagnoses are totally just like based on patient interview and what their symptoms are. Um, and some diagnoses uh, kind of show themselves through objective measurement. Um, so we have acoustic and aerodynamic equipment that we'll use, and that has been pretty standardized across our practice. And recently, ADA um, put out like just an article in 2018 on the recommended objective measures of instrumental voice evaluation. Uh, and it tends to be what almost every voice center around the country uses in terms of the data. So if I were to look at someone's report from another voice center, I can basically understand the same objective information. You know, it's like a pediatric therapist using the same test across setting. You can interpret the results just based on your own experience with it. Um, so we do uh, uh, acoustic aerodynamic testing. And we have some patient reported outcome measures, um, maybe from graduate school, people might remember the voice handicap index or other measures that help measure kind of the patient experience. And then of course, with every patient, uh, we take a look at the vocal folds with laryngoscopy, more specifically stroboscopy. I actually have the privilege as a voice therapist of not ever seeing a patient without seeing their larynx, um, mm. which is pretty specific because I know a lot of therapists are being asked to do voice therapy without ever knowing what's going on. Right, uh, really common in our field is getting a report from a doctor that says patient vocal folds closing normal needs voice therapy because they're dysphonic, but that doesn't tell you anything. Like why are yeah. they having this dysphonia? That's really, really tough thing. Um, so all of our patients uh, get scoped in our practice. And if they did not come from our practice, then I will, I will scope them something. Something will happen where I get to see their vocal folds. And this is similar just to the, I mean, you have to forgive me. I, this is, I've been out of grad school a long time and uh, my voice experience is very limited, but is that similar to just, um, so um, it's just the camera that goes in your mm -hmm, nose mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that they get. So, okay. So that's, it's, that's still the same. That hasn't still the same. changed. Hasn't changed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I had to have that done and the, um, I, I was told it, it, it gave me grape, um, grape flavored spray, okay. and, but it did not help. It's, no. it's very uncomfortable. It also it tastes, feel the good. spray tastes terrible. Yes, yeah. it does. I wish I would have gone without the spray, but yeah. yeah, it was definitely, it was really interesting for me to see that 
for myself of like, oh, that's me. But um, yeah, it was that technology was just so cool. And it was the how clear the the visuals yeah. were. I was yeah. just so impressed. Yeah. So so every single patient you want to see what is going on, regardless Correct. of what okay. And that makes sense because you're right. You may they may say this is happening and then you see, oh wow, well that's why, because right. there's this giant giant right. polyp or because you know, saying someone's voice is hoarse tells you nothing about how it is or isn't working other than it's mm -hmm. abnormal. Mm -hmm. Um it could be a polyp, it could be a paralysis, it could be just muscle tension, right? And so I, I am not in a profession that guesses. That's not what I do. I don't think that's what we do. And so I like not to. Um, we're having the same conversation in terms of like dysphagia treatment, right? You can't treat what you don't know is happening. Um, yes. And you can't target your treatment if you don't know what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to get a similar message across in terms of voice and voice disorders. I have a lot of therapists reaching out to me on social media or professionally. I have this patient, you know, with this voice, what should I do? I don't know. I don't know how to help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen their throat. I need some you know? more information. Um, yeah. But that's a really, really, really common thing in our field. Yeah. And, and so it's, I love how thorough it sounds like you all are from the beginning as well. So it just almost is like, doesn't waste anybody's time. It's like, let's get right to what, well, let's, oh, for let's sure. find out what's, what's going on. Yeah. I think sometimes patients um, are so, surprised at how quickly everything happens, but I'm like, let's get to it. <laughs> yeah. But that's great because sometimes it's like, okay, we're going to do this, this visit, and then you're going to have five more and then we'll finally be able to tell you. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. I'm sure that still maybe even is what happened, you know, maybe if you have a more complex case, but so once you do the assessment and do, are you able to, do you collaborate with the ENT to come up with what you both think is going on? Like, how does that yeah. That process work. So the speech pathologists in our practice see the patient first, and we do oh. uh, the air, the acoustic aerodynamic testing, mm -hmm. patient history, some of the patient reported outcome measures. So we spend a pretty significant time with the patient, and then they see the physician for the uh, laryngeal exam. And um, in between those visits, we'll talk with the ENT. And because this is a work that we do, often patients. The profiles of disorders will stay pretty similar. So I only see voice disorders, so I'm kind of overexposed. And so you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on just through the testing without seeing. Uh, thankfully, I don't, once again, I don't have to guess um, because we have the physicians there with us. So they will um, take a look, but we collaborate then after their visit to see what's going to be best. Sometimes I get to be in the room with them, but often I'm seeing another patient at the same time that they're seeing the physician. Um, so we collaborate a lot on, is this patient a good patient for you or Teresa or another therapist? You know, do you think they need to do pre, pre-operative therapy or should we just do the surgery and you'll see them after? So we, we collaborate a lot in that. I love that your expertise is so valued in this, in this oh, practice awesome. because, you know, I've worked in hospitals where it's like. Uh, well, thanks for your suggestion, but we're not doing yeah. any of that. It's like, why am I here? Why? So I, lo I love that you are such an important part of this process, if not like one of the key pieces. Yeah, I, I've thankfully got to present with a laryngologist that I work with on this exact thing, right? How do we collaborate as physicians and speech pathologists and what is the role? You know, we are functional experts in terms of like the anatomy and physiology of the larynx, as are they in terms of tissue and muscle and disease in a way that I am not. Um, but it's the marriage of those two things that probably help us get to the end, the patient's end goal a little bit faster. Um, and so, yeah. And to be honest, my time costs less than a physician's time. Um, and so when we're thinking about practice setup, I have the ability to, to do a, a lot of the hefty, heavy lifting in terms of education and even diagnostic therapy can be diagnostic, right? By working with a patient, you can find out more that helps lead you to where you're trying to go. I can do that all day. I cost less than a physician. Their time is better spent doing other things. So use me, yeah. this person who is also an expert in a different way to help us get to where we're trying to go. Yeah, that's a great point as well. Just, you know, being smart with the resources. So 
Yeah. And so once you determine what, what the diagnosis is and what do you determine, are you able to tell at that time, let's say if it's a, a, a polyp, like, okay, this is about how long you're going to need therapy. Mm. This is how many sessions, right? Like, can you, or is it really just a, you have to start and see how they progress, how motivated they are, what they're willing to do? Yes. All of those. <laughs> and, and I think what's, uh, what's interesting about voice disorders is there's some voice disorders that are chronic, right? They're, they're there for life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are some that aren't, right? And, and like you said, uh, it depends on their motivation and their, uh, their body's literal willingness to change. Um, mm -hmm. It even comes down to therapist, right? There are some patients that work with me that don't get benefit who may get benefit from another therapist. And so there are a lot of variables at play and we try to account for them. Um, some disorders act pretty standard. Um, so if somebody has a surgery for a polyp, they'll see us for a few weeks after. And then honestly, usually they're good to go. Um, some patients take more time, some patients self-discharge, you know, after two weeks and that's okay. Um, I, I like to think of myself as a resource. Uh, I'm certainly an expert in voice as a study, but the patient is the expert in their body and their voice. Uh, I am a resource. We exist to be a resource. We're not here to tell people what to do, but rather to offer it. Um, and so I really invite patients to take from it what feels helpful and beneficial based on what feels right for them. And when it's no longer helpful or if they've reached their goals, that's it. Great. Um, once again, I don't have productivity standards, so it really allows me to be flexible in terms of what I recommend mm -hmm. I do or don't. Of course, there are standards for this is what this typically looks like, um, and this is what we can expect. And then there are some that we get to be more flexible with. Yes, yeah, so you're able to really just do what's best for them and and meet them where they're right. at. And that's <laughs> wow, what a what a concept. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, that is not uh, and that is that's not how a lot of our field works, unfortunately. No, especially oh. in outpatient therapy settings and, and practices. It's not oh. how it works. Uh, I could tell you stories, but yeah. off air. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so let's say, you know, for example, um, uh, a paralysis or a paresis, mm. what would what would that treatment look like for kind of your standard patient? So um, let's do just a, like a case. We have a let's say 42 year old female who's coming in post thyroidectomy with a vocal fold paresis left side. She's presenting with like a mild to moderate dysphonia. So her voice is abnormal. Other people can hear it and a lot of fatigue and effort. We see that there's kind of maybe some incomplete closure and the physician says, you know, I can do um, a temporary vocal fold augmentation, right? Where they inject maybe a material into the vocal cord to help with the closure. Um, help with the weight of the vocal folds and help the patient have a stronger voice. However, the patient is skeptical about doing a procedure and they would like to try therapy. Well, great. We schedule two to three sessions of voice therapy. They have a third session scheduled, but at the end of the second session, the patient's like, you know what? I don't think this is going to help me. And I get to say, okay, let's do what feels right for you and, and what's right based on kind of the information that we have. I get to cancel their third session and we schedule with the physician pretty quickly to have a procedure done. And then the patient goes into the office and has an injection uh, to help improve the closure of their vocal folds and then improve the strength. That patient will then see me after the injection because once again, my time is less costly and I do a lot of the follow-up for the patient. So the patient will see me regularly. How are they doing? How are things going? We can meet virtually. Uh, and then maybe in a month, they'll come back and see the physician uh, all through that time, kind of working through therapy. And we follow along as is necessary. There are some patients who do that therapy portion in the beginning and find that that gets mm -hmm. them 80% of the way there. And that is all they need. Perfect. Uh, and then there's some patients who, you know, get this injection, feels like it really benefits them and they would like something more permanent maybe. And then they have a thyroplasty with a physician who still see me before and after. And so we kind of like do this really flexible play between what we have to offer in terms of the patient and the practice. It's the dance. The dance. <laughs> it also, it also makes it really challenging, um, to be honest, that flexibility because everything is so special 
that on a day where I'm seeing eight patients, no one patient is presenting the same or needs the same care as the other mm. person. So I will say it's also mm-hmm. phenomenally exhausting. Um, Just because you're always having to be at level 10 and think through it because it's days. not like, oh, I've, I've, yeah, I've done that twice today. It's like everyone is, okay, I got to put my detective skills on. I got to figure yeah. this out. I got to, yeah, yeah. I, um, I could see that that would be. Take graduate students almost every semester. And um, <clears throat> they, after the first week, are like, this is a lot. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, every day you are here, it will feel like a lot. Like, strap in. Here we go. It's a really cool learning opportunity, yeah. but it, it is overwhelming. Yeah, it sounds like it's you won't get bored. It's like you're always, <laughs> like you probably you probably long for that sometimes. Like I, I just I need, I need a boring day. I just do. let today be boring. Yeah. yeah. I would have loved to have been a graduate student with you. How fun. I I bet you're just a phenomenal mentor. I like to so. have a lot of fun. They're, they're... I, I tend to be what's interesting is I tend to be socially very relaxed and then in clinic it can be a mm-hmm. bit intense, but that's I, I really want people to learn and I want us to do the best for our mm-hmm. patients. And so I tend to be tough for that exact reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and would you say like, let's say they decide, you know, they're going to go and have the injections and then when they come back to you, is it more of, again, that education about how they need to use their yeah. voice differently? Yeah. What? Yeah. It's a lot of like, how, what do you do now? Right. And what can you expect? Mm-hmm. Um, and it also allows mm-hmm. me to see if it was successful or not, right? And yeah. also one of the beautiful things is I don't work for the physicians I work with. And it allows mm-hmm. me to be really candid and upfront with the patients, right? Mm-hmm. And so if I think something wasn't successful, I challenge yeah. that, right? If I think mm-hmm. there was a decision that was either incorrect or potentially needs to be made, I do that. I advocate on behalf of the patient. Uh, Mm -hmm. which also gives me an in, in terms of playing a role, um, in the care of the patient. I think often we see ourselves as secondary and I was really grateful to be both at the university of Pittsburgh and the university of Wisconsin where the speech pathologists have a much different, more, if we want to call it aggressive, sure approach, right? We are members of the team that decide care Mm -hmm. and that's it. I, I would never work in a practice that didn't see me as that. And I would you know, advocate for a lot of therapists to um, adopt parts of that approach mm-hmm. that feel applicable to them in their practice. No, I think that's a really important reminder because it really does feel defeating. And you're like, well, I went to school for all this time. Here I am. Yeah. I, I'm the subject matter expert in this. And it's your opinion is not valued and you're not looked at that as a member of the team, mm-hmm. a, a primary man, member, mm-hmm. like you said, we, you know, so I think that's a great reminder to, to really almost advocate for ourselves Mm -hmm. and, and what we know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's an, that's, you're making me think a lot today, Maurice, and I didn't really, (laughs) so I, I, that's a good thing, but I'm just, yeah, I'm having a lot of thoughts. Um, so what, when you're, um, you know, thinking about kind of like prognosis, Mm -hmm. uh, prognosis, like, oh wait, what's the plural? Prognosis? Right. What is it? <laughs> okay, when when okay, okay, a patient prognosis. Let's just keep it singular. So we, <laughs> um, so do you ever have some where, because voice is so much of it's like they have to own mm-hmm. so much of it. You mm-hmm. can't. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's certain things like you know you said like giving the injection. Yeah, that's going to help, but then they have to mm-hmm. own the rest. So there's a lot of accountability. Mm-hmm. Do you have that discussion with them as part of that those sessions where this is what you know, you're going to, this is going to be your role in this. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you can't do that, then this, we're not going to have the outcomes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's something I actually do upfront. I kind of describe my role. Once again, I describe myself as a resource and I say, you know, I'm here for the taking and my, my goal is to provide you with resources. So I, you know, send recordings home. I'll record parts of our session so that the patient has kind of an auditory reminder. I take notes. I send notes. I send videos. I send resources. And then it's the patient's kind of responsibility to take those on and how it fits for their life. I do have some tough conversations, for sure. I, I, I'll straight up say to patients, like, I don't think this is working, and I don't know that it's the right time for you. I, I sat in front of a patient very recently 
who maybe didn't want to be there and literally had already paid to see me, sat in the chair and five minutes in, I was like, do you want to go home? And they were like, yeah. I was like, great. Went to the front desk, refunded their money and they left just because they didn't want to participate. They didn't want to be there. Yeah. I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> Clearly they, mm-hmm. they, they, for some reason came, um, you know, we, it, I, yeah, it's tough, right? Because it, it's what yeah. do patients want to participate and give? And there's so many things. Oh my goodness. If anything, COVID taught me is that I have to have more grace for myself and for my patients. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. People are going through yeah. so much. Um, and loss is a big, I think, regular part of people's life. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially people who we see people when they are not well, right? That's why we exist yeah. sometimes. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of just sitting with yeah. people and understanding that things are not great. So. Yeah. And I think it's a good reminder too, you know, I'm thinking about the person you just said that was like, do you want to go home? Yes. <laughs> I mean, who knows what, I mean, at least they were yeah. honest. Right. And, um, but you know, you just, I, it's a good reminder. You never know what's going on mm. with them. And I think it's so easy to take those things personal. Like I'm thinking that probably would, sting a little bit, you know, for many yeah. of us to think, well, why? You know, I didn't even, you know, why don't you want to see what, or, you know, I know that sometimes I've heard clinicians say, yeah, this family fired me yeah. and it stings, but it's like, okay, it, you can't take as hard as it is. You have to release that. Like it's not personal because you're right. People are on their own journey totally. and you just never know what's going on. And it's most of the time it has nothing to do with yeah, us. I have, um, yeah, there's some patients of mine who have switched from me to my colleague and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, sounds good. <laughs> or who have like asked not to come back <laughs> or who like want a referral to another therapist. And I'm like, sure, that sounds good. I don't even question it. I'm like, yep, of course. A bit, I also think patients should be autonomous in their healthcare decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am the yeah. first person to say yes. Even sometimes when I don't think it's the right decision. That's not my body. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking... If you have somebody that's you know got vocal hoarseness, but it's like I smoke a pack of cigarettes yeah. a day, I drink a pot of coffee. Yeah. No, I don't drink any water. No, I don't. It's like, well, this is like if they're not ready to make those changes, then it's pointless to yeah, you know, and ma- maybe that isn't the right time. Yeah, I see that a lot know, with like um, information. But... Sometimes younger people, right, who like still like to go out and party and have a good time, and I give them the information and we go through the therapy thing, and I'm like, you know, losing your voice every weekend in a club. Um, is is a choice and you're definitely allowed <laughs> to make it sure um that's not my job to tell you not to do it these are like maybe potentially yeah. the long-term consequences physically um and so mm-hmm. just keep that in mind and then i say you know i'm not going anywhere you know where i am yeah. and how to reach us and i will be a resource as long as it feels helpful to you yeah and that's a great way i love that approach because it's not if you know, had you they come in and it's like the finger wagging, yeah. you should, it's, well, what did that accomplish? Yeah. You know, that's so, yeah, you've given them information and, and if at a time they're ready, it would make more sense. So, mm-hmm. um, so, okay. In, and you also have a private practice. Yes. <laughs> Who do you see in your private practice? Yeah. I know in all your, your free in time, all of my free time. Right. <laughs> so that was like kind of birthed <laughs> right before uh, the pandemic had begun you know, I knew, so I was pretty early on into my tenure as a speech pathologist, but I knew there was like a subspecialty of patient populations that I had the ability to work with, maybe who were under or uninsured, um, or who just didn't have insurance that worked with the practice that I work at. Um, And so that was kind of birthed as like, I want to work with singers and artists and people who use their voice professionally, who maybe didn't want to go through the hospital that I work for. Um, And so I started to do that and still do that occasionally. Um, I kind of balance the private practice in in terms of like, I see patients and then I also really love educating and giving lectures and talking. And so it's allowed me to then kind of have a business line where a lot of that comes through and helps me see those things Mm -hmm. as work, Um, which I have a lot of trouble doing because I'm passionate about it, but it is work and it is my time and my energy. And so looking at it that way has really helped me create like a life work balance as opposed to just like everything I do is, you know, I am my job and I'm not right. It's work, right. Business is work. My job at the hospital is work. And so seeing it as Mm -hmm. that has been really helpful. 
Whereas before I might just jump on a Zoom call and help someone. No, I'm like, this is my job. This is what I do professionally. Mm -hmm. And naming it and titling it and having it done formally mm -hmm. helps me look at it that way. Yeah, I think that does, and you're right, it doesn't help it bleed into your other interest in your time. That's not, because you're right, that is it, that I always say it's a part of life, mm -hmm. it's not your mm -hmm. life. Um, I, uh, just a quick side note, I was listening to this podcast, I thought it was interesting. And the person speaking was saying, you know, that we shouldn't even be asking kids, like, what do you want to be mm -hmm. when you grow up? What do you want to be? Because it's like, immediately puts this thought of like, oh, that's, you know, who you are. Like, you know, instead of like, oh, I want to be you know, a kind person, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to be a helper, I want to do it's, it's pretty already where, well, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I'm six, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so it was just an interesting way to think about it, where, um, yeah, it's, it's a part of who we are, but it's not who we are. My, so um, it's a good reminder. My like lesson to young clinicians, you know, I, I had all these great educational opportunities and publishing and speaking and then, you know, being brown and a male speech pathologist and in kind of like the adult medical voice world tends to like you stand out a lot. And so there were a lot of opportunities offered and I took all of them and I really mm -hmm. for a while got wrapped up in doing it was a lot of doing because I felt like mm -hmm. I wanted to, right? But I also felt like I had to. And mm -hmm. and I got lost in the a speech pathologist is who I am. It's not. And it actually took a pretty, yeah. pretty big crash and burn, <laughs> like exactly 12 months ago. Um, but, you know, I used to be on social media a lot. And if you go to my Instagram page, mm -hmm. which is still like a primary way that people get in touch with me, I like hardly post anymore yeah. because I got so wrapped up in that. Right. Um, and I'm just now learning through, thankfully, a lot of my own therapy, <laughs> like psychotherapy mm -hmm. and time away from work that I'm more than my work. Um, so for any new clinicians yeah. or even people who are maybe feeling that, right, that, that there are other ways of finding joy and happiness and fulfillment outside of something that's also tied to money and fame and notoriety. There's so much out there mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with us and our degrees. Yeah, I, um, I, I uh, very much <laughs> support yeah. everything you just said and could not agree more. And I think when we do find that balance and don't feel that, uh, because I, I think you're right, there's a lot of where, and I remember I was there, I was like, I've had to prove myself, I have mm. to prove myself. And, and like you said, I mean, you probably felt that even to a, a more of a degree, um, you know, being more of a minority within this field. It's like, well, I got to say yes to everything. I've got to yeah. prove myself. But I think when you, I think you're right. We, if we step back from that and, and we actually then become better at our mm -hmm. job and enjoy our job more instead of feeling like, like, it, instead of, it's just take a step back instead of feeling like we have to push forward. Yeah. It's, it, it, but it, it does, it creates a, just more fulfillment yeah. and we're, and then we're more productive and, and, better yeah. than we do. I would say even like the private practice thing probably started as a bit of like a vanity project, if I'm being completely honest, right? Like I am good enough to hey. have this thing. And now it's turned into like, yeah. oh, this is this avenue that I can help people that one day mm -hmm. I probably will grow a lot more than I do now mm -hmm. um, to allow my life to have more flexibility. And so it's not even mm -hmm. that it's a bad decision, you know, three years later, uh, two years later, whatever. Uh, but I just kind of reworking the way that I look at it. Uh, to allow me to have more fun and enjoy the people in my life and my family and to dig into the things that I mm -hmm. want to do. Yeah. And all it is, is you have options. Yeah. That's it. You have a lot of options. And if you want to pursue that, it's there. And I mean, you're obviously very good at what you do. So I'm sure you would have no problem if you wanted to just make that your full-time yeah. job, but I love that you are just taking it as it comes. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So what is next for you professionally? Ooh. What, what is, question. what is your, what are your, what are your thoughts? I'm really enjoying uh, this like education piece. Um, so I'm adjunct faculty at Lamar University and that started over the last year teaching uh, as a part of like a vocology program, which is kind of the mix between music and speech pathology and voice, and voice disorders. Oh, cool. So I get to teach. Oh my gosh, it's made I for know, you. I get to teach a lot of like postgraduate voice professors and professional voice mm -hmm. coaches and teachers, the part of the work that we do. Uh, I love that work. Um, I really love the education piece. I love educating other clinicians. Um, so sometimes we, you know, there are branches of how we express ourselves professionally. And I don't know that I see myself as patient forward 
I, I like that part of my job, but I really love working with clinicians. Um, and so there's probably something in there that I'll continue to dig through and figure out. Um, but for now, I'll continue to take students. I'm, I'm starting uh, with my first CF, my first clinical fellow is starting in oh, August, yeah. which has always been a big desire Exciting. of mine, right? To kind of take and train the next crew coming through. Mm -hmm. So we're starting a clinical fellow then. Um, yeah, just just ways to help locally in the areas that I that I physically work in, and then other areas uh, mm -hmm. broader. How can we help the field and help grow things? So doing that, uh, and then what's next? Life wise, I don't know. <clears throat> I've really gotten into bartending at home. <laughs> so some of that, oh. um, you know, exercise, keeping my body healthy as I get older. I'm like, ugh, things are. I'm feeling the thirties, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely the better we take care of ourselves, the better our body takes care of us. I mean, it is, it is so true. Yeah. Um, well, I am just so glad that you found this profession because I feel like you really do make it better. What a, you're such a great contributor to this profession, and I, um, I, I'm just like, oh, I'd love to have you as a professor. <laughs> I want to do my CF with you. I want to, <laughs> um, because I mean, I do think you're. I you obviously have that passion for, Hey, I, I have the information and it's not mine, 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 but Hey, I can't wait for you to have this information yeah. too. And I just, I, I think that's such a, a wonderful giving spirit. And I, I, again, I'm just so happy that you're in this profession. Thank you. It's, we need more people like you. Appreciate it. So, well, Maurice, it has been so, I could, I could keep you here all day, but um, you are busy. So I am so grateful for your time and for just the conversation and, and Again, I know you don't do as much on Instagram now, but we will. You do have some great information on yeah. there. And so we can link that so people can connect and find you. Totally. And um, yeah, I just I, I just appreciate your time and, and your um, expertise you. in sharing. Yeah, and so like my professional email is linked to that account too. So if people need anything, I have students reaching out often and other clinicians. Sometimes I'm bad at responding in, in a timely manner, but... <laughs> People are allowed to bug me or nudge me and I'll get to it. Well, I'm sure that's very appreciated. So thank you. And we'll put that in the show notes so that um, people can find you. Perfect. So thank you thank so you, thank much. Thank you. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.